Hello and welcome to this Deakin University alumni webinar with presenter Dr. Neera Bhatia. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today we're broadcasting from Deakin's Burwood campus and our webinar topic is Uncharted Territory, the new era of social media and its impact on end of life decision making for critically ill infants. Also a content warning for today, this webinar references child mortality and may be distressing for some people. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Dr. Neera Bhatia is an associate professor at Deakin Law School. She is the author of Critically Impaired Infants and End of Life Decision Making, Resource Allocation and Difficult Decisions, published by Routledge Cavendish. Her research interests are in the areas of end of life decision making concerning critically impaired infants and children, organ donation and voluntary assisted dying. She regularly appears in the media as an expert commentator, engaging with the wider community on topical issues in health. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nira. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining me today for what I hope will be a interesting webinar. Um, it may be a little challenging, and I'm hoping that you are attending this webinar today with uh, an open mind, um, as to the discussion that we are going to have. As uh, Sam has introduced me, I will keep my introduction very short. I'm an associate professor in the Deakin Law School. Um, my research interests, as Sam has mentioned, uh, primarily in end of life decision making. I have recently uh, started to look at uh, social media and the role of social media in, and its um, impact in decision making uh, for critically ill infants and children. And today I'm going to focus on a few high profile cases that have occurred in recent times in the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm also going to look at the role of innovative medical treatment and medical tourism as a result of um, increasing use of the internet. Um, so that's a very brief introduction and there'll be time for questions at the end. So let's begin. So over the past five years or so, um, at the centre stage of various media platforms, there have been news stories of disagreements that have occurred between parents and critically ill uh, infants. Uh, in the United Kingdom, which is the cases I'm going to uh, focus on today, um, around medical treatment, decision making. Before we look at those cases, I think it's important that we have a very brief conversation about what we mean when we talk about disagreement. Uh, it's important to start by saying that disagreement between parents and medical practitioners or medical uh, teams is rare, it doesn't occur often, at least in terms of cases that go before the courts. When parents and uh, medical practitioners or medical teams disagree or um, don't agree on medical treatment for critically ill children or infants, the usual process is to attempt to use a shared or collaborative decision-making process to attempt to decide what uh, is the best way forward in terms of medical treatment for um, critically ill infants or children. I use the word uh, infants or children here um, loosely in terms of infants could be really young children, children could be older children. I'll focus on infants here uh, for the purposes of this presentation. It's important to also note that parents cannot refuse or cannot demand treatment um, that they consider might be in the best interests of a child. And when we use the term best interests, it's a very difficult concept um, in legal terms because there is no real normative basis or formal definition of the word best interests. Now, we all might have our own idea of what best interests is or are in terms of what is in the best interests of a child. However, as we will see with these cases, these high profile cases that I'm going to focus on, two in particular, 
it's a very difficult concept for the courts and for parents when disagreement occurs and for medical practitioners, for all three parties, parents, doctors and judges to actually agree on what is in the best interests of a child. Now, when these types of disagreements between doctors and parents, when they reach an impasse and when they reach a tension point, um, in certain circumstances, as I've said very rarely, um, the intervention or the need for the courts to intervene um, becomes apparent. And it then becomes an issue for the courts to make a determination as to what is in the best interest of the child. Now, looking at judgments, we know that the courts will then consider issues such as futility or whether further treatment is futile or whether that is in the best interest of the child. Or the courts will weigh up the benefits of treatment against the burdens of treatment. So what I guess we're saying here is that it's not a, uh, a simple process of the courts always determining and saying that treatment is in the best interest of the child. And the courts will look at the quality of life for the child. So the courts won't automatically say that they should err on the side of life. The courts might actually, and in many cases have, as we will see, made the decision or determined that in fact it's no longer in the child's best interest to continue life-sustaining treatment. Now recently over the past five years or so as I've mentioned there's been a number of cases that have been center stage in the print media and digital media platform around stories or cases of critically ill children in the UK that have also certainly here in Australia, have captured a slice of public attention. And the first of those cases that we can talk about, or I want to talk about in particular here, is the case of Charlie Gard. Now, very briefly, I'm conscious of time, Charlie Gard was a case of 2017. At eight months of age, Charlie suffered a very rare genetic condition. Disagreement occurred between Charlie's parents and the treating medical practitioners at Great Ormond Street Hospital in England. And his parents sought at that stage to uh, uh, try and obtain a particular type of uh, innovative treatment, nucleoside therapy, and they wanted Charlie to be transferred to the US to receive this therapy. Now the therapy itself um, was known to possibly provide a small chance of improving Charlie's quality of life, although it was very clear that there was no cure for Charlie's rare condition. Great Ormond Street Hospital considered that the life-sustaining treatment should be withdrawn as it no longer was in Charlie's best interest and the disagreement over the treatment between his parents and the hospital resulted in several legal appeals before the courts and eventually Charlie's parents withdrew their opposition to the withdrawal of treatment and Charlie uh, passed away. The second case, 2008, involved another critically ill infant named Alfie Evans. Now at approximately six months of age, Alfie was admitted to Older Hay Hospital after suffering um, seizures and showing developmental delay. And it was found that Alfie suffered uh, degenerative neurological condition, and there was no definitive diagnosis for his condition. Now, he suffered significant brain damage with no prospect of recovery. Similarly, his parents disagreed with the medical practitioners about the continuation here of ventilation, which we can also refer to as medical treatment. Alfie's parents wanted Alfie to be transferred to a hospital in Italy for further medical inter investigations and intervention and for the continuation of life support. And again, similarly to Charlie's case, after several legal appeals and challenges, the continuation of life-sustaining treatment was considered to be no longer in Alfie's best interests and eventually treatment was also withdrawn. Another case that occurred in the same year was the case of Isaiah Harstrup, which didn't receive as much media retention. This child was born by an emergency C-section, a caesarean section, um, 
and he suffered uh, significant brain damage and a dispute again arose between his parents and the medical practitioners treating him. And by the time he was 11 months and the case went to court, the court determined, the High Court in England determined that it was uh, no longer in his best interests for treatment to continue and treatment was therefore withdrawn. So what we see or what these cases reveal, these three high profile cases reveal are emerging developments in the way that these disagreements were um, handled or managed by the parents. And what we see is that there was greater involvement by the parents in the process of medical treatment decision making. And there were three things or three developments or emerging developments that I want to focus on for the uh, purposes of today's webinar. And the first is greater access to the internet and social media and crowdfunding, all three which were relevant in these high profile cases, which we're going to look at individually in a moment. That's the first thing. The second thing is that parents sought innovative medical treatments, sometimes referred to as novel treatments. These are treatments that have perhaps not been proven to be effective or have perhaps not ever been tried or used before. And thirdly, child medical tourism, which again is where parents might seek to take their child overseas or parents might seek second or third opinions where they don't actually agree with the first medical opinion that they have been provided with. So what we see here is really, you can look at this in a circular sense where the key source is the internet and therefore it becomes almost connected. So parents might initially rely on using the internet to research other options available to them. Um, and that research leads them to then find innovative or novel treatments. And then that leads them to seek to go overseas through virtue of child medical tourism, to then seek other countries to provide them with medical treatment that they feel that is not available to them in their home country. And this was relevant or uh, in some shape or form in these cases, in the Charlie Gard case, um, in the, Ash, uh, the Alfie Evans case and the Isaiah Harstrup case. Now you'll see from my second point, I also make reference to a case uh, of Neon Roberts, was another case in the UK and also closer to home here in Australia, it was also relevant in a case a few years ago from Western Australia involving uh, a child at the age of six known as Oshin Kizko. So let's start by looking at that first point as an emerging development. When we look at the issue around the role and impact of the internet, what do we see? So what we see or what these cases reveal, these high profile cases, is that we're seeing a changing relationship and a changing dynamic between parents of critically ill children and healthcare professionals. And this is that there's a challenge, parents are now perhaps challenging the prevailing orthodoxy. There's ready access to the internet, which is providing parents with a greater sense of empowerment and being self-informed and able to diagnose or re-diagnose and educate to some sense, perhaps, healthcare professionals about their child's medical condition. Parents might refer to the internet as their initial source of information when they're first informed of their child's medical condition. And parents may, be less willing to solely rely on or accept the medical diagnosis or the medical opinion that they are given at first instance. So this is a huge, powerful um, tool available to parents now that they may not have had 10 or 15 years ago. What we also saw 
with these particular cases is uh, the use of social media in a really powerful way. So in the Charlie Gard case and the Alfie Evans case in particular, there was a sophisticated use of social media and social media campaigns that were particularly central to the case of Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans. And what we saw in the Gard case and the Evans case in particular is that the parents perhaps employed the tools that were at their disposal or easily available at their disposal. And that was the use of the internet, uh, photographs that they were able to take of their children, and the use of social media. And when I talk about social media, in the Guard case and the Evans case in particular, the parents in those cases very effectively used Facebook, uh, Instagram to a lesser degree, and Twitter. They also were very successful in mobilizing the support of the public at large. And when I talk about public, as you'll see shortly, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, not only in England, but on a global platform. So internationally, um, there was uh, very professional websites that were set up while these children were in um, hospital, as well as online merchandise stores to sell um, merchandise that was for Charlie Guard or Charlie Shop, as well as Alfie's Army, using very, very sophisticated uh, trending hashtags. So people on a global scale that did not know these infants, did not know these families, many of whom had little to no clinical knowledge or legal knowledge, felt a sense of solidarity towards these uh, critically ill infants. Um, and it's an interesting use of hashtags. If you look at this, Charlie's army, Charlie's fight, Alfie's army, Alfie's war. Um, the language here is really, really interesting that was used. What's the reason for this? I don't know uh, conclusively, but um, I speculate that they were very, very young parents. In both cases, the parents were in their very early 20s. In fact, in one of the cases, parents were uh, 18 or 19. And they were first time parents who vehemently disagreed with the clinical and legal uh, determinations that had been made. And they had an overwhelming sense of belief and hope that the treatment, the continuation of treatment was in the best interest of their child. And quite possibly, and this is a speculation, I don't know for sure, but I speculate that they might have considered that, that if they were able to garner enough public attention, they might have been able to overturn the legal decisions. Now, the most significant thing about the use of social media in these cases, as opposed to using traditional media, newspapers or radio, for instance, was that in these cases, the use of social media allowed the parents in these cases the ability to self-report. So they were the ones who were those most intimately involved in the care of these critically ill children, and they were able to direct and control the narrative. They were able to upload photographs as they wanted to um, direct the narrative in the sense of choose the hashtags that they wanted to and they were able to completely control the story uh, that they wanted to impart. And there's been a lot of academic commentary around this that, in fact, the hospital and the medical practitioners were not able to um, give their medical opinion or use social media or respond to comments um, and that the information that was imparted using social media was very one-sided. So this is what we talk about when we talk about an echo chamber, because what it allowed for was only a one-sided perspective of what was happening in these cases, and it only allowed for like-minded followers with no room for any dissenting opinion. And that's what we mean by an echo chamber. So, Using social media in these cases wasn't a case of somebody reading a newspaper or listening to the radio. There were streamed videos giving supporters or members of the public a sense of living through the journey that these parents were going through and a greater sense of solidarity or kinship or loyalty um, to a family and to children that they'd never met. 
Um, and it also allowed um, the families to raise awareness of these rare genetic conditions that Charlie and Alfie uh, were suffering, which we've never seen before. It allowed outsiders to come in and be part of these families. As I say, it allowed um, uh, the families to really direct the narrative that they wanted to report. So still working with this idea of social media, um, what was really significant in the Charlie Gard case, and even more so in the Alfie Evans case, which followed on from the Charlie Gard case a year later, which um, it has been said by other academics, and I also argue this point is perhaps that with the Charlie Gard case may have to some degree set a template for the Alfie Evans case in how to mobilize um, support and use and how to use social media to um, effectively gain public support is that where previously where disagreement has occurred between parents and doctors and it's been done so um, in a very private intimate setting um, where you may not have heard of disagreements between parents and doctors only if it goes to the courts and on, only then if a judgment has been uh, passed or handed down and only then really if it's been picked up by a newspaper um, otherwise members of the public may never hear about this what we see as being really significant from the Charlie Gard case and the Alfie Evans cases where previously quite intimate private decision-making processes were conducted in a private consultation in hospital uh, hospital rooms or consultation rooms or before ethics committees as a last resort before cases end up going to the courts what we see in these cases is that we're being played out in a very very public arena and unfortunately becoming tabloid fodder. If you type in Charlie Gard or Alfie Evans into Google, there's a lot of um, interesting, um, but also really almost tacky media circus type information that is available on the internet, which is really, really sad and really disappointing when you think of what these stories are about. And at the heart of these stories are two really, really critically ill infants that can't speak for themselves and are relying on others to express uh, information on their behalf. So when we talk about a public consultation, what it allowed for was some helpful um, consultation on a broad platform, a global platform, but unfortunately, it also allowed for, with the use of social media and the internet, it also allowed for some very unhelpful interest and activity from third party transnational actors. And what I mean by that is it allowed for people, not only that were sitting in the UK at the time, but people from other countries overseas to insert themselves and use these cases that were receiving a lot of global public attention on a global platform. Um, it allowed third party actors to use these cases as a springboard for their own vested interests and for their own social or political agendas and use these cases as a springboard to uh, lobby for their own political agendas over the internet. And unfortunately, by doing so, in these cases, particularly in the Guard case and the Evans case, um, I would contend that many people uh, lost sight of the best interests of the, the baby or the infant who was at the core of this issue to begin with, whether it be Charlie Gard or Alfie Evans. And it could be argued that in both cases, well-intentioned parents may have traded their own 
privacy and the privacy of their child in order to gain public support to get the medical treatment that they sought, which undoubt, undoubtedly is a really difficult situation to be in. So these are things that I think may have um, occurred. Now, what I have here are some images that I've obtained from online newspapers that I'd like to share with you um, just to really paint a picture of the things that I've been talking about thus far. And what they show is, uh, you'll see here, you can see the words around Charlie Gard and the other side is Alfie Evans. And what these pictures demonstrate, or I hope will illustrate, are the public protests that occurred while these cases were going before the courts. And what they show is the level of public discontent um, at the time, and many of these people, hundreds and thousands of people protested. You can see there are young children outside who would have no idea who Charlie is or what they're outside protesting about. But what we see here, and academic commentary has suggested this and made comments around this, that it's suggestive of a broader issue um, at the time that perhaps people here that are protesting are not simply protesting around the issue of uh, providing medical treatment to Charlie Gard or to Alfie Evans, but perhaps are showing discontent on broader issues around um, their unhappiness with the National Health Service in the, the UK at the time, showing discontent um, around issues around Brexit or broader issues around discontent with uh, Trump, but have used the case of Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans as a springboard to protest using these cases of these um, critically ill children. So I think I just wanted to share these images um, to show you through this webinar around what was happening at the time um, of people that have never seen, uh, never met Alfie or Charlie and don't know Alfie or Charlie, but what was happening at the time. Now, this is a really interesting and I think a really poignant um, quote from Justice Francis um, in the Charlie Guard case. Uh, and I think it's a really it's a really interesting quote, and I think it's a quote that I think sits well. Um, to think, and it's a quote that I think we all need to think about. And Justice Francis made the point in saying, the world of social media doubtless has many benefits, but one of its pitfalls, I suggest, is that when cases such as this go viral, which it did, the watching world feels entitled to express opinions, whether or not they are evidence-based. And I think it's a really interesting point Justice Francis makes here, and that is with the good comes the bad, and Justice Francis highlighted this. Now, much of the information um, that was shared by the families, with good, in, good intent, I'm sure, in wanting to um, do what was in the best interest of their children, much of that ended up being misinformation, and much of the information that was further disseminated by supporters of Charlie Gard or Alfie Evans ended up being misinformation. Um, especially around the clinical diagnosis. And a lot of the information that was shared was one-sided because the medical practitioners and the hospitals were not allowed to also share their views via social media. Um, and perhaps, as I mentioned, this idea of transnational actors using the platform, um, social media platforms, and using it as a springboard to um, pull forward their own political agendas, perhaps used it to hide used social media or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram to hide behind as an anonymous cloak to um, put forward their own political agendas. And I think Justice Francis has really made an interesting and valid point in his judgment here. Now, another very unique aspect or an emerging development that was revealed in these cases was the use of crowdfunding. Um, and crowdfunding was used to try and um, raise funds in the Guard case, the Evans case, and the Harstrup case. Now, the Guard case raised the most amount of money. It raised £1.3 million sterling, and that was raised to assist 
we travel to the US for Charlie Gard to undergo the nucle nucleoside therapy, the experimental therapy that I mentioned very early on, um, that had never been proven to have been effective. I think at that stage it hadn't even been um, trialed on mice. Now that money obviously was not used because the courts didn't um, rule and allow for Charlie to go overseas. That Those funds have since been used to establish the Charlie Guard Foundation, which will can, um, now provide support and research for children and adults and their families that have been affected by mitochondrial disease uh, or conditions. The Evans case raised uh, just over £140,000 um, and similarly will be used for a foundation for children with undiagnosed conditions. And the Harstrup case uh, raised just over £3,000 and that account has since been closed. But I think there's a, a broader issue that needs to be considered when we're looking at the use of crowdfunding, which seems to be an increasingly um, common occurrence now um, in, in uh, Australia and uh, the UK, and that is that we need to consider the ethical issues that uh, come with crowdfunding and those issues are around the equitable distribution of healthcare and access to healthcare and privacy. Now, the success of crowdfunding campaigns appear to be based on capitalizing on emotionally appealing stories and evoking empathy. Now, in this regard, appealing to members of the public to donate to a cause, which is what crowdfunding does, it um, uses the word donating to causes, of course, um, a cause being to donate money to critically ill children over the internet and gathering support is likely to prove fruitful, but um, I think there are other ethical considerations that need to be thought about when we're thinking about crowdfunding um, and where uh, that money goes um, if uh, treatment uh, the money isn't going to go to the treatment of, um, of critically ill um, children. So that's something that I think needs to be uh, thought about in more detail. Now, the other two emerging uh, developments that I mentioned, I think, also need to be considered here. And that is that parents might have researched or found on the internet um, innovative or novel treatments that might offer hope of a cure or some improvement to the quality of life of a child that is critically ill. Now, they might be seeking treatments that are still undergoing trial and might be uh, therefore effective, but remains unproven or treatments that might not be available in their home country. Uh, for instance, in the Charlie Garden Alfie Evans case, that was in the UK. Now, there is still um, academic debate ongoing as to whether um, whether parents should be allowed to travel overseas to access innovative treatments if there is no other possible hope. So, and this is an ethical and moral quandary. If you have a critically ill child that has no other options available other than the inevitable. Uh, other option is as, as morose or morbid as it's going to be death. Should you give that child the option of trying a novel treatment as a last resort? And that is something that remains um, an academic debate. Now, it's currently unclear if disputes do arise um, and whether this sporadic approach to access to innovative treatments, um, whether we should allow uh, parents to simply take their children overseas or uh, whether it's still in their home country to be able to have the option of trying unproven medical treatments, as I say, whether it is simply a last resort. Um, and I think it would be beneficial to gain, gain greater insight. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, researched further as to the how, the why, the what of those innovative treatments that parents might be seeking. Now, the other thing is if it's not an innovative, unproven treatment, in some cases, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Osh and Kisco case here in Australia, and the Neon Roberts case, which is an older case from uh, the UK, parents might request an alternative or complementary treatment 
rather than an unproven treatment that's still undergoing clinical trials. So parents might say, I don't want a conventional medical treatment. If a child has cancer, for instance, and the options are radiotherapy or chemotherapy, parents might actually say, I oppose these treatments, but I want my child to undergo a natural um, herbal therapy um, as opposed to a conventional therapy. And again, medical practitioners might oppose this and say no, a conventional medical treatment is the best option in the best interests of the child. And in those cases, that might go to court also. So that's something else that is um, a situation or circumstance where doctors and parents might disagree. And the third issue um, is the issue of child medical tourism. As I mentioned um, earlier, there's been a considerable growth in child medical tourism, pro which provides individuals from varying uh, socio-economic um, backgrounds, um, including developed and less developed countries, the opportunity to gain different, not always better, sometimes better, but different medical treatment options. And parents of critically ill children, as we saw in the King case, um, uh, sorry, we haven't discussed King, uh, apologies, the Guard case and the Evans case, um, parents might seek to travel overseas to the US, for instance, or to Italy in the Evans case to obtain second opinions or to obtain other medical treatments overseas. But again, there are other op, uh, factors that you need to consider when you're thinking about medical treatment overseas. And there are issues of privacy, confidentiality, medical uh, negligence and variation in regulations and governance that need to be considered. Um, in those circumstances, it's not always as clear cut as saying, well, my home country, whether that be Australia or the UK, as we're seeing here in these cases, isn't providing my child or the child with the treatment that I want, but another country is offering it, so therefore the child should be allowed to travel to the other country um, to uh, seek those treatments. Um, one point I didn't make early on was the use of social media was so powerful in the Charlie Gard case and the Alfie Evans case that um, it, those cases actually gained the um, attention and the support of really influential um, figures, including uh, the Pope, um, Donald Trump, um, and uh, the president of uh, Poland. Um, and that is another factor that came into these cases where the US um, and Italy had given um, Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans um, citizenship for those countries to travel overseas, to receive treatment overseas. Um, and therefore, uh, the parents said, look, our, our child's been given citizenship to go overseas to America and go overseas to Italy, and therefore, please let our children go overseas to receive these treatments. And the courts in the UK still determined and concluded that no, the children shouldn't go overseas and it was still in the best interest of the child for treatment to be withdrawn because nothing more could be done for these children in a medical sense. Um, so there are other things to think about. So what do these emerging trends in medical treatment uh, decisions mean? What do these trends that I've been talking about mean? It means that I guess my conclusions here as I'm wrapping up is that the internet social media and access to innovative medical treatments and child medical tourism are all, if we connect all of these things together, show that there's been greater parental readiness to scrutinize and challenge medical opinions and to seek alternative medical treatments. And what we're seeing here is that the landscape is being reshaped, the social and medical landscape in which the care and treatment for clinically um, ill infants and children is taking place. It's fundamentally reshaping how medical treatment or end of life decision making is occurring. It's not occurring as it once did. We're challenging the traditional orthodoxy of paternalism, of doctor knows best, and parents are becoming far more um, uh, robust in challenging the traditional medical orthodoxy. There's probably, I would argue here there's need for further discussion and cons consideration 
in how we develop or we reform the law and policy and governance to safeguard the best interests of all parties when disagreements arise. So we think about this and we talk about, I've been talking at least today, about the best interests of the child, but I think we need to look at this in a more broader sense about the best interests of, of all parties. So in my concluding um, remarks today, I want to go back to the title of this webinar and the title was or is um, Uncharted Territory, the new era of social media and its impact on end of life decision making for critically ill infants. So is this a new era in end of life treatment um, decision making or are these three cases simply an aberration? Are they a one off? Um, I don't think so. I don't think we can call this an aberration, but I also think it's too soon to know. There's only been a few cases, as I say, these high profile cases. Um, but I think the manner in which these cases played out very publicly, it didn't affect the final determination in these cases. In all of these cases, the court still determined that treatment should be withdrawn, that the continuation of treatment was no longer in the best interest of the child. But what it did do was it impacted the process. And what I mean by impacted the process is the process was particularly protracted, it was long, it was drawn out, it was particularly traumatic, no doubt, for um, the families involved, for the medical practitioners that were involved, um, and particularly, I'm sure, in some regard, for the public, who were also, I now refer to as a fourth participant. So social media, crowdfunding, and um, public opinion on a global scale, particularly in the Charlie Gard case and the Alfie Evans case, potentially will impact future cases. Um, the process, as I say, was protracted. There were more legal challenges. It was traumatic. It was bolstered by public support, which might have actually inflated the parents' perceptions of their chances of success. There were a greater number of external parties that intervened, as I mentioned earlier, with possible alternative agendas. And I've written about this before, about the tension between different groups that are involved in end-of-life treatment disputes, parents, doctors, judges. And I now question whether we have a fourth participant in treatment decision-making and disagreements, and that is the public at large. And doctors and other professionals, healthcare professionals, um, are now being confronted with the knowledge that where treatment decisions and disagreements do occur, they are unlikely to remain in the confines of a hospital or a courtroom or in an ethical um, ethics con consultation. Um, and in fact, in these cases, health care professionals did report feeling unsafe. And um, this was dealt with by uh, the judges, the judge in these judgments. So what are the alternatives? There's been discussion in academic debate and uh, commentary about alternatives to a courtroom. Should we consider mediation or tribunals as a less confrontational um, method of dealing with disagreement uh, rather than an adversarial system such as a court? Um, and I guess on a final uh, conclusion or note here, we need to consider the best interests and the principles that guide best interests while keeping the critically ill infant as a central focus. Now, the critically ill infant's best interests need to be considered, but we also need to consider the safety and well-being of all other parties that are involved in end-of-life decision-making for critically ill infants, because other people's interests are also being affected by something as innocuous, yet something as powerful as a smartphone when we're using social media in end of life decision making. And we need to consider, um, we need to use far more civility in the ongoing discourse and dialogue between parties. So social media and the internet, I think is likely to play a significant role in end of life decision making for impaired 
infants and it's challenging decades of conventional conservative traditions and principles um, in a world of increasing hashtags, likes and retweets. Um, thank you for your time today. That concludes my uh, webinar. All right. Thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, Nira. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> we'll start the discussion session in a moment. So now's the time for attendees to write any questions you have into the questions box on your screen and then submit. We'd love to hear from you. And we've got a bit of time now, so please do um, send any questions through if there's anything you're wondering about. Um, and we've had a few come through during the webinar. So I'll start with a question from Lauren who asks, whether the courts have ever ruled in the favour of the parents in situations like this? Thank you for the question. Um, they have ruled in favour of the parents, but they do so very, very rarely. There's probably been a handful of cases. Um, in fact, in the Oshin Kisco case that I mentioned um, close to home here in Australia, um, the courts did finally, and the case went to the court three times, and finally, eventually, the courts did um, rule, I wouldn't say they ruled essentially in favour of the parents, but in that case, um, the parents wanted alternative uh, treatment for their son, who was six years old, uh, had cancer, and the medical um, team wanted, their clinical opinion was that um, Oshins should have been treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And each time the case went back and forth to the courts, the parents in that case wanted um, natural therapies and herbal therapies. And each time that the case went back to court, Oshins' chances of um, improvement and cure for his condition reduced. And by the time the case went to the court the third time, his chance of improvement had dropped significantly. It actually dropped to about 30%, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. Um, and in the end, the courts actually just uh, decided and ruled that he could, and the mother and father in that case, the mother in particular, wanted a son to only receive natural uh, natural therapies and wanted him to only receive palliative care. So in fact, in that case, it was quite the opposite. So the parents weren't actually demanding aggressively for treatment. It was actually the opposite. They uh, wanted him to only receive palliative care, wanted him to be cared for at home, didn't want him to receive blood transfusions or aggressive treatment, wanted him to simply receive home, home remedies and to receive palliative care. And in the end, the courts actually did say that he could and he um, did pass away at home with his family um, and that's what occurred. But by and large, overwhelmingly, the courts will um, conclude that treatment is, um, if the, they conclude usually in um, agreement with medical opinion. So if the medical opinion is to treat, if they believe that a child will make a recovery and the child's quality of life will increase and get better, the courts will usually uh, agree with that medical opinion. If the medical opinion, as we saw in the Guard case and the Evans case, is that the child's futility uh, of life or quality of life is not going to get better, the courts will um, usually agree with the medical opinion in that case. I hope that's answered your question in some way. And um, please do keep those questions coming through. We've got a little bit more time. So I had another question, which is um, my understanding is that in Australia with adult um, cancer treatment, at least, there's been somewhat of a move away from the paternalism and toward patient-centred treatment yep. um, from, from the medical profession. What, I suppose, what's the tension there in the balance, um, knowing that a lot of education needs to be done for patients and their families um, and that kind of thing? Um, so if I understand what you're saying, is this around, um, sorry, I'm not sure. Um, so <clears throat> my understanding is that somewhat something's already happening towards that move away from maybe the sort of um, the doctor focused approach yep. towards a more collaborative approach of um, from from profession in Australia at least that I know yeah um, 
with some of the tensions there might be maybe just that you know the patients might not know all that enough about their what they've got and what the options are yeah. to make those decisions. so yeah so that's a good question so i think we we there's always more work to be done in that area but we've we're definitely working more towards making patients adult patients at least um more um aware of uh, medical treatment decisions and autonomy and I think an important point around that is the Medical Treatment Planning Decision, Decisions Act at least in Victoria that came uh, into force last year and that's really about ensuring parent, uh, patients know about their choices and the decisions around medical treatments available to them but in terms of children uh, that's a really difficult one and I think the courts still to some, to a greater degree, uh, still take quite a paternalistic view. And you see that um, even in cases where you might have um, an adolescent. So uh, up until the age of 17 and six months, we've had cases of adolescents that are 17 and six months and might refuse a blood transfusion, for instance. Um, but the courts think it's in that adolescents' best interest, even when they're six months away from turning 18, but the courts will still take a paternalistic view and say, no, we know in six months you can lawfully, as an adult, say, I'm not going to have this blood transfusion and we can't prevent you. You can turn around and say, I'm not having it anymore because I'm an adult now. But up until that point, the courts will say, no, we have parent patria jurisdiction, which essentially means parent of the nation. We are your guardian and we are going to um, give you that blood transfusion. So there's still, we talk about greater autonomy and um, sovereignty over your body and rights over your body as an adult when you have legal decision-making capacity, but there's still that great wall or that divide for until you reach that that age I guess. Mm -hmm. Thanks we've got a few more questions that have come through so I'll try and um, get sure. through them. Um, here's one from Sally in saying that we should consider the best interests of all parties do you think that the courts should consider the impact of their decision on the parents when deciding whether or not the child receives treatment for example even if treatment appears futile, could it be justified given the psychological benefits for the parents? That's a really good question. And it's, a, it's something that the courts consider, but I think, and this is my, my view, is I think they consider the interests of the parents, um, but in a very notional sense. So you see this in the judgments uh, where the, the courts do, the judges do discuss the interests of the parents, but the courts have an underlying um, responsibility and that underlying responsibility comes back to the child and it comes back to that jurisdiction I was just talking about and that is the parents patria jurisdiction and that is that the ultimate welfare of the child rests with, lawfully rests with the courts, whether we agree with it or not, parents under common law, parents cannot make decisions for their child. And there's a lot of academic commentary around this and ethical commentary as to whether people agree or disagree. But a parent cannot ultimately say, this child has been born of me and therefore I make the final decisions that um, are to be made for this child. So the courts will always say, we take into account that this is a really t difficult decision for parents. We understand that you love your child, you want to do what's best for your child, but ultimately we are responsible for the final decisions that are to be made, life or death decisions for this child, and we will make that final decision. And that's why, as I mentioned really early on in the webinar, and I said parents cannot demand treatment and they cannot refuse treatment. Um, and it comes back to these principles of welfare. Now, I think um, that the best interests of all parties should um, be considered. Um, but currently, as I say, the courts will ultimately say the paramount principle is 
that we have to consider the best interests of the child being above everybody else's and therefore the courts decide what that is, um, even against what they think the interests of the parents might be. And even if they think the parents are doing, you know, the best thing for the child, the courts will decide what that is. Right. Thank you. And thank you for that great, great question, Sally. Really appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time to get to um, the last few, but um, I'll put an email up in a second where um, we can you can get in touch with us. If you have any more questions, we'll pass them on to Nira, but also yep. um, we might be able to answer those questions directly afterwards. Sure. Um, so we'll just... Right. Um, just to note that if this content has raised any issues for you, please do contact Lifeline, lifeline.org.au or 131114 or Beyond Blue on beyondblue.org.au or 1300 224 636. Just a note on the social media topic that um, we do have a presence, Deacon alumni on social media, and we would love to hear from you and, um, you know, have uh, the uh, constructive conversations that we do have um, online. So we're on Facebook and LinkedIn and please do um, follow us. There's an offer from Deakin alumni to um, come back to postgraduate um, study. You get 15% of your course fees for yourself or direct family. Please see the website for more details of that. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much to Dr. Nira Bhatia. Thank you. And the email address to get in touch with us for any feedback or questions is deaconalumni at deacon.edu.au. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.